Thank you for joining this fireside chat. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Kevin Shapiro, who's one of our pediatric neurologists. He'll be speaking about ADHD and the approach that we take at Cortica. We'll also be hearing from Erin Hildebrandt, one of our amazing pediatric nurse practitioners, to answer some of your questions about nutrition. Hi, I'm Kevin Shapiro, Director of Research at Cortica and Medical Director for our states in Wesley Village, Florence. We've received a couple of questions from parents who aren't sure whether Cortica treats kids with diagnoses other than autism. The answer is definitely yes. Although a lot of the kids we see do have an autism diagnosis, our model is really designed for any child who has challenges with motor control, sensory processing, communication, attention, or executive function. In short, any difference affecting the development of the nervous system. That includes differences with known causes like genetic conditions, epilepsy, or brain injuries, as well as differences that don't have a single identifiable cause. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the most common neurodevelopmental differences, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. According to the CDC, almost 10% of children in the U.S. under the age of 18 had a diagnosis of ADHD. Boys are diagnosed about twice as often as girls, but that might be in part because symptoms in girls are more often overlooked. Like other neurodevelopmental conditions, I prefer to think of ADHD as a difference rather than a disorder. It might even have some advantages. For example, sometimes people with attention deficit disorder might even be better at managing in high stress situations. On the other hand, there can certainly be challenges when it comes to everyday situations like school, sports, or social interactions. One parent sent in this question. Could you please address the pros and cons of medicating my child with ADHD? Would my child need to take ADHD medication every day for the rest of his life, or else risk struggling with the symptoms of the disorder? Well, whether or not to use a medication to help with symptoms of ADHD can be a tough decision. Medication is rarely any parent's first choice after getting a diagnosis. In fact, a lot of the time, symptoms can be managed very effectively by making some changes to a child's environment and learning strategies to cope with situations that might otherwise be overwhelming. But sometimes it turns out that these accommodations just aren't enough. The child is still struggling with schoolwork or daily life skills, and that's where medication can come in. There are different types of medication that can be used for ADHD. The most commonly prescribed medications are stimulants, which are forms of either amphetamine, like Adderall, or methylphenidate, like Ritalin. Within each of these two basic classes of stimulant medication, there are many options that differ mostly in terms of how they're administered and how long they last. All stimulants are thought to work by increasing the brain's levels of norepinephrine and dopamine, which are neurotransmitters that are important for maintaining alertness and focus. In people with ADHD, the brain networks that process information tend to be noisy and sensitive to interference, kind of like a radio picking up signals from multiple stations. Norepinephrine and dopamine help those networks to tune in to the appropriate channel. Even though medications that increase these neurotransmitters are called stimulants, getting rid of the static can feel calming to many people with ADHD. At the same time, stimulants can also suppress some signals that are coming from the body like hunger and fatigue, which is why the major side effects are loss of appetite and difficulty falling asleep. Not everyone experiences these side effects, but when they do occur, they can often be managed, for example, by picking a medication that's taken after breakfast and wears off by dinner time. Unlike some other medications, stimulants typically start working quickly and wear off completely. They don't usually require a ramp up or a washout. For that reason, some people choose to take them only on school days, skipping weekends and vacations. This is a perfectly safe and effective strategy. But because stimulants can actually be calming to people with ADHD, many do choose to take them every day. In large studies, the only significant long-term side effects of stimulants taken in childhood is a slight decrease in adult type, about a centimeter. When prescribed appropriately, stimulants aren't addictive. Now, some people don't respond well to stimulant medications. Children who are prone to irregular heartbeats uh, because of certain genetic conditions, for example, in most cases should not take them. Others already have high levels of norepinephrine or dopamine. With these kids, stimulants can cause agitation and irritability. 
At Cortico, we sometimes use a test called pharmacogenomics to predict how likely a child is to do well with medication based on his or her body's ability to process various biological substances. This test is easy to do. It's done by a cheek swab, and it can be especially useful if medication has been tried in the past and didn't work, or if a family member has had a negative experience with medication. If the stimulant isn't the right choice, other options could include medications like anamoxetine, which goes by the brand name Stratera, or guanfacine, also known as Panax or Pintunin. Many children eventually outgrow the need for medication. They might still have ADHD traits, but they learn to manage them effectively as they mature, or they choose a path in life where those traits can actually work to their advantage. High-intensity, creative, passion-driven fields in healthcare, art and design, or journalism, to name a few, those can be a great fit for people with ADHD. Another question that we received, I'd also like to learn about combining medication with treatment, such as nerve feedback, occupational therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Might we see improved outcomes with these treatments if my son is on ADHD medication? This is a great question. I like to think of medication as just one of the tools in the toolkit for ADHD. As I said a few moments ago, medication can act quickly to suppress some of the noise and brain networks that are important for attention and information processing. Other therapies can help rewire those networks so they work more efficiently. These therapies take longer to be effective, but the end result is often a more robust and resilient brain. The main difference between non-pharmacologic treatments is the level at which they're effective. Cognitive behavioral therapy and other kinds of psychotherapy are what we call top-down. In other words, they help you consciously think about strategies for attention and organization. On the other hand, occupational therapy is an example of a bottom-up approach. By focusing on physical awareness and sensory processing, it helps improve control of the body and the subconscious ability to navigate situations where there might be a lot going on. Music therapy works in a similar way. In theory, neurofeedback works at an even more basic level by training the brain to modulate its own level of arousal. Also, there are other ways to affect the physiologic systems involved in attention and arousal besides using that. For example, diet is a huge factor. Reducing sugar and processed carbohydrates can help stabilize energy levels. Some children respond really well to eliminating foods with diets and additives. Also, deficiencies in nutrients like iron and folate can impact the body's ability to produce key neurotransmitters like dopamine and norepinephrine, which therefore impacts attention. There are even studies showing that supplements like fish oil, which is rich in omega-3s, can improve attention as much as medication in some children. So to sum things up, when treating ADHD, it's important to think about both short-term and long-term strategies. Both medication and non-pharmacologic treatments can have an important role. Sometimes medication calms things down just enough for a child to begin to really engage with therapy. Sometimes it's the missing puzzle piece, and sometimes it's not needed at all. We always have to consider the whole child in their environment to achieve the best results. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Hildebrandt and I'm one of the nurse practitioners working in our Cortica San Diego office. Today I'm going to answer a question about nutrition and autism. This parent asks, what is the ideal diet for a child with autism spectrum disorder? Which foods should be avoided and which should be included? This is a commonly asked question because nutrition and diet tend to be some of the most confusing, evolving, and even controversial areas in medicine and the general population. It becomes even more complex in the setting of a child with a neurodevelopmental difference. There are many diets, secrets, and opinions out there about the importance of specific nutrients, foods, and even whole food categories. But in general, there are a few principles that most nutrition specialists, medical providers, and researchers can all agree upon. First, it's helpful to think about diet in terms of expansion prior to restriction. So we know many children with autism have dietary preferences related to taste, texture, smell, and even their visual presentation. So it's always important to think first about how we can improve the diet by adding in nutrient-dense foods prior to phasing out some of the less nutrient-dense food items. Generally though, there are a few things to keep in mind when thinking about feeding your child. 
first focusing on a predominantly whole foods, plant-based diet with sources of high quality protein, incorporating a diet uh, with a variety of different types of fruits and vegetables to make sure that they get plenty of fiber and their digestion is fully functioning, drinking predominantly water and avoiding sugar sweetened or calorically dense drinks, avoiding processed foods, such as foods high in sugar, preservatives, dyes, as much as possible, because we know a lot of children with neurodevelopmental differences can be really sensitive to those additives. Trying to incorporate natural sources of things like pro and prebiotics can be helpful, and those include a lot of foods such as sauerkraut, miso, kimchi, asparagus, and onions, garlic, and many, many more. We also know that due to the limited diets of children with autism, they sometimes are at risk of lacking basic nutrients. And these can be evaluated and identified by your healthcare provider and then targeted specifically. But generally, if you ensure that your child gets a variety of different fruits, vegetables, and high quality protein, they usually will be able to fill in a lot of those nutritional gaps. Some children have different energy needs and requirements and would benefit from things like additional nutritional supplements or supports. Uh, other children might have food allergies or sensitivities and might benefit from what's called an elimination diet. If you think that your child falls into one of those categories, your healthcare provider can partner with you and your family to provide guidance and ensure that your child is getting a well-rounded diet to help their growth and development as those needs will always continue to change. If you're interested in additional guidance on nutrition, eating habits, or feeding therapy, both myself and our nurse practitioner Megan up in Torrance are happy to meet with you and your family and support your child and your family as you guys embark on this unique nutritional journey.